we we all gonna have to do whatever is needs to be you know is necessary. So I'm I'm a, I'm whatever you need. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over so y'all introduce yourselves. Start with my healthy brother. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Healthy Brother. Um, <laughs> my name is Ryan Mundy. Uh, I am a uh, entrepreneur investor. I have a uh, alternative investment company, Tech Lead Ventures, uh, where I invest in sports, health and well, health and wellness opportunities, in digital media, tech and non-tech related. Uh, and then the subsector of that tech is cryptocurrency, tokenization, and blockchain. Um, most recently, started a non-tech business uh, called Swizzle around the uh, movement away from plastic straws. So I have a metal straw company. Uh, I just look for arbitrage opportunities in the marketplace and try to capitalize on them. Uh, prior to that, I played eight years in the NFL, um, five in Pittsburgh with the Steelers. Uh, there we go. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, too. Oh, and then uh, one year in New York with the Giants, and then two in Chicago, where I currently live at right now. Call it Kaepernick. <laughs> Pleasure. Once again, name's Jamari. Um, easy way to remember, Jamari on Safari is Ferrari. Jamari. Um, so background, went to Howard University for my undergrad as well as for my MBA. Then went to Carnegie Mellon for my PhD in engineering and public policy. I am currently ABD, so that's all but dissertation. I did all the classwork, but didn't finish my last paper. Um, I'm on my second cryptocurrency company. The first one I did was the Quantum Resistant Ledger. I was a co-founder, which had an ICO last year. Um, we brought about a 10-time return to our initial um, participants. It was a top 100 cryptocurrency, valued about $100 million. Um, before I exited to work on the Digital Reserve. The Digital Reserve is currently in development and is focused on eliminating predatory loans and high interest rates through using a cost-based proof-of-stake system that creates a reserve for, for lending um, in a way that minimizes debt um, to our people and increases productivity um, without collateral. So um, I'm really interested in this space of digital assets as well as what initial coin offerings are supposed to be about, which is an initial distribution of the network um, that makes it function in the way that is intended, not necessarily just as a fundraising mechanism, but as a means of effectively running your network. Hello, I'm uh, Pascal Summer with the CoinCentrics team. It's a, a blockchain research firm based in Atlanta. Um, originally, I'm a, I have a background in telecom. I've worked with AT&T and Sprint, or actually still working with Sprint at the HQ level. Um, basically, we do research in a wide range of things from education. Last year, we were actually here at Georgia, at the, I'm sorry, um, Howard University. We had the grant from the Zcash Foundation, and we're very interested, interested in, in probing the HBCUs and understanding the different levels of, of uh, uh, adoption of cryptocurrency and identifying different um, drivers we can use to um, basically make the technology widely adopted in our communities. Um, apart from that, I'm also involved with a decentralized mesh um, application or, or, or platform being built um, called Aldea. Actually, I got the connection to be working from them from Daisy, as she spoke earlier about advisory. I think it's a really good role for a lot of people to be involved in. And uh, I think that's enough about myself. <laughs> uh, I'm back. I am um, gonna join this panel as well uh, to give uh, both an academic but also a lawyer's perspective on ICOs and some of the things to think about. The time that we have, we're really hitting the high notes, but it's to just bring to your awareness how fast this space is moving. So for all of the quote unquote regulatory uncertainty we talk about on a regular basis, uh, even today within the last couple of hours, the SEC started pushing out in enforcement actions, uh, one of the first of its kind, and they are, there are many more to come, particularly given the ICO boom of 2017. So we need to have that as an ever-present reminder that just because the ecosystem says, oh, I have a utility coin, it doesn't make it so. You have to understand the Howey test and the history of it and the, the reason for regulations and rules and to govern yourselves accordingly, pun intended, from the very beginning when you start to ideate uh, um, for your project or your token. 
And so we'll talk a, a bit about that. And, and there's a wealth of information on this panel, so it's a, it's a great opportunity for your questions um, at the end as well. Hi, my name is Bet Lazilik. And growing up, I thought I was going to play in the NFL. So we got that in common. <laughs> Unfortunately, that didn't work out, so here I am. But um, yeah, so I'm an associate uh, at Perkins Cooey. I'm in the investment management group. Uh, we represent mutual funds, uh, private funds, investment advisors, and other pooled investment vehicles and asset managers with combined assets under management of over a trillion dollars. And we, I'm also par uh, part of the blockchain group uh, where we have lawyers, I'll say about 70, that work with the blockchain technology and about 40 of them exclusively work on blockchain technology and digital assets. Um, prior to that, I was a part of the SEC's honors program and I was an attorney advisor with the SEC. And prior to that, I was clerk for a federal judge. So I kind of have private sector, regulator, and litigation backgrounds, and happy to be here. Okay, um, so I have a self-serving question. Um, what are ICOs? Who wants I, to I, take that? Yeah, ICOs are initial coin offerings. Um, how they're, they're used diff is differs between um, who, who's issuing them. Um, typically, they're being leveraged as a way of crowdfunding or a ways of raising funds for people. However, the initial intent was as a means of d distributing the tokens. Because whereas um, Bitcoin uses what's called a proof of work system, whereas people are actually mining or working to actually earn the coins in the validation process, um, within the ICO area, people are their pre-mined or the genesis block actually has tokens which are already can be allocated to people at the initial start. So to jumpstart the, the network and those network effects that are necessary for a network to sustain itself, they, they, they sell them and that, and selling them establish an initial value that can then to start the, the engine moving. It's really a way of jumpstarting the, the system in its um, an initial purpose. Now it's a, a means of raising funds, I think. <laughs> And uh, going back to 2017, if 2017 wasn't the first time, but we saw these astronomical raises where people were doing an in run around the traditional crowdfunding raise. Uh, and we saw, you know, triple digit million dollars. Don't even get me started on Telegram uh, and some of the others. And that's why I said earlier, I don't think that we're going to see that anymore because we run the risk of dumping a lot of money into a project that's not been developed yet. And that's the question about to the extent that you are uh, doing a raise, it's gonna be a security unless you can demonstrate that, that the system is up and running. And a great example of that is Ethereum and, and Hinman uh, back in June or July, I was uh, doing a, a presentation for Yahoo Financial and about two panels before me, Hinman from the SEC came out and that was the day he said, uh, Probably Ethereum started out as a security, but at this point in time, it's reached sufficient decentralization that it is now no longer a security, which also raises questions about this unique asset class that is very dynamic. It can start out as a security and wind up uh, uh, being a commodity and having some utility down the line. Uh, and so those are the interesting questions that come up, but it all originates from the original source of the ICO and a fund raising project that at the beginning starts as a common enterprise. Uh, relying on the work and effort of the promoter of that token or that project, and that's the rub. Do you have something that is actually useful in this moment, or are people speculating on its utility at some point in the future? Well, since the, the, well, since the collective um, uh, crypto IQ in this group is higher than mine, I think it's only fair that uh, we open it up early to um, questions so they can have more time to, to respond freely. So if you have any questions at the moment, raise your hand and I'll come to you. If you had a statement, you can make that statement. Somebody was eager to go. Yeah, I just also want to add that it could start out as being not securities, then evolve into securities as well, based on how you're marketing it. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind as well. How you doing? My name is Justin Redrick. Um, I wanted to know how you all felt about majority of the ICOs not having a product available at all. Um, as you said, they are purely speculation, and they push about a quote-unquote white paper, like the Bitcoin white paper, but really it's nothing more than a Word document. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you address that in making sure 
the future of ICOs actually have products and actually have what's considered a white paper? Um, that's a really good question. I think, you know, we, we need to figure out, and it's really interesting because the ethos of blockchain cryptocurrency is all about algorithm, rules-based, governance, etc. But there is no accountability measures for the folks who are going out and raising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars per clip. Um, they could get all that money, and that all that money comes in one swing, but there's no follow-up or no true accountability to say you have to go out and do what you, you said you're going to do. So I think that's the first step. We need to figure out what is this process if you do an ICO, you know, can, can you structure it in such a way where I guess it's more like traditional financing and say if you raise $40 million, the first $10 million is available in tranche one, and then you need to hit certain milestones to unlock the next $10 million and so on and so forth. Um, we're not there yet, but I think, you know, we need to figure something out uh, because obviously there, um, not everyone is acting in good faith uh, when they're going out and writing these white papers. Uh, but again, there is no accountability uh, or anything to make sure that these folks are doing what they say that they are going to do. Um, so we need, we really need to come together as a community and figure out what that looks like. And I think it really depends on what the structure that the offering is in as well. Because there are ICOs that's just out there with a wallet address and you send funds and they say we're going to compensate you at some later point. However, we are seeing more in different instruments that are being used. Um, we have um, d debt instruments, we have the SAFT, which is supposed to be a simple agreement for future tokens, which, which is more so a security. Um, you have um, the token DPA, which is a tokens as a debt payable asset, which is basically a, a debt instrument, which is saying, hey, the, the, there's interest on this, there's certain protections, different milestones that, that we have to hit, and we'll pay you along those things. There's also some, in work, some decentralized options, like Aragon or the Ethereum network, which is supposed to provide some governance for, for doing exactly what, what he, he described, actually. It's saying you, you can set up tranches or different milestones that have to be hit before funds are, are released. So people are working on those answers, and those are some of the projects that I find interesting. Those who are trying to provide these decentralized um, methodologies are protections at, at the beginning point. Um, that's actually what we're doing with the digital reserve. We're actually um, using a token as a debt payable asset as well as a, another debt asset to be able to provide our initial distribution um, to people because we recognize protections are needed. Okay, from my perspective, I actually think it's very important ICOs began the way they did and for any technology that is disruptive, it's very important in the early stages to capture all of the you know loopholes. And within a short amount of time, I think that's what happened with ICOs. Um, there was a lot of you know um, inflations of projects, projects without products, like you said, which in a normal setting is somewhere in Silicon Valley. I'm not sure you know VCs would want to even entertain those ideas. So I think it was important that it went through that you know turmoil, and now people have a. Cl I think people are beginning to build a clearer vision of um, vetting out projects. And I think doing an ICO now is not as easy as probably oh, I'll say not. a year ago, where all you needed was a white paper. I think there's a lot more from a legal standpoint to protect yourself as an individual, not even as the business or whatever. So. Um, I think the most important thing going forward is learning from what is happening right now. And quite honestly, I'm happy it happened within a sh short amount of time. So. Yeah, I just want to touch on something really briefly because all these ICOs previously were open to everybody in this room. But now moving forward, and I thought of it when you said the SAF agreement, like mm -hmm. that's limited to accredited investors. So thinking about and accreditation requires like a million dollars net worth or a certain income threshold within um, two years. But thinking about now how, because it's all a game, right, and rules and games require rules, and thinking about how this thing is going to be set up, and you mentioned that Silicon Valley got caught off guard big time yeah. <laughs> because a lot of uh, regular folks were making a lot of money and it was flowing away from those guys because their fund documents wouldn't allow them to invest in those type of opportunities. But now moving forward, the, the rules are being set up again to go against the ethos of crypto and blockchain and saying like decentralization for the people because most of the people are not accredited investors, right? So if you're going to capture these early returns and these 
significant discounts or gains or what have you, um, you need to have a certain amount of wealth. But that is that that's being put into place so that the old powers that be, the or the old guard can now reestablish their foothold in their position, uh, so that they can maintain uh, ahead of, I guess, the rat race, right? Um, so it's 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 all it's this big game, big game that's being reworked and re refiguring out how to structure it again. Hello, hi. So this is a real question. This is not a hypothetical question. So I have listened to the Hinman statement. Uh, of the SEC, I listened to the Hinman statement on SEC that once something that maybe was once a cryptocurrency, uh, sorry, was once a security, may not be a security later on. I've heard that. And I'm familiar with the Howey test. Uh, Ripple, uh, Ripple's uh, currency or the currency that it uses, XRP, is the third largest market cap cryptocurrency in the world, right? And the SEC is lagging on whether or not that is a security. Can I have your thinking caps from the panelists who have studied regulation, studied law, right? What is the issue on XRP? Is it because the technology is so new? Is it because it's so widely uh, used? Um, uh, it does have real utility, unlike many of the cryptocurrencies. It does have real utility. Uh, um, Ripple. The company has about three uh, flagship uh, projects, XRapid, uh, XCurrent, XVIA, right? Is Securities Exchange um, going to make Ripple a security, yes or not? The world is watching. You know no lawyer is going to actually say definitively one way or another. <laughs> it depends. Uh, my understanding of the concern is that it's not fully decentralized. Um, there are a lot of other fish to fry before they get to Ripple and XRP. They're going to go for the low-hanging fruit, it seems, in my hum humble uh, non-SEC estimation. But that is my understanding of what the general conflict is. It's not fully decentralized. Hi, I'm Clev Mesador, great panel. I do want to say something in support of ICOs. As a startup founder, I do think ICOs have gotten a bad rep, but I, I want to echo what one of the panelists just said, was everything is in, an, is in its infancy has problems and bugs, but I will say for people of color, ICOs are a great way to get early funding for your project. And there, there are a lot of folks who, who are not who are outside of this whole VC funding structure that did get it. So I, I think I think ICOs are a good vehicle, and I think there's a lot of bugs to be fixed. But I think you know it's not fair to frame them as all scams. And one of the things to remember is the space is so new. Almost every project is still in the beta phase. Most pro great projects can't even be produced because of the limited developer pool and the resources. So I do think for some. ICOs, the projects have not moved forward just because they haven't been able to get the resources that through an ICO, that once they do, then they could create a product. Because this space is really hard to bring a product to fruition, even an MVP right now because of these challenges. So I think the ICO sector deserves the criticism, but I don't think it's fair to call it all scams. And I don't, I, I don't think that anybody asserted that they were all scams, but it is understanding the, uh, so yes, period, and I absolutely agree. The other side of that, uh, or in addition to that, I should say, is then just know the rules and know that if you have to register or if your project qualifies for an exemption and to use it uh, for smaller raises in that basis, you do um, reg crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, excuse me. So there are a lot of ways to participate, prop, but you have to know the rules and then follow them accordingly. So I got a quick question. With this technology being used um, and created to stop being a part of the system, why are we so adamant on adding regulation? Why are we so adamant on trying to add laws when the technology itself, like an ICO, if I put up a smart contract tomorrow, that smart contract can issue the entire ICO and who's regulating that? Nobody has to regulate that. Anybody from all over the world that has an Ethereum wallet can actually participate. 
why are we so adamant on trying to go back to the old system when this technology was created to get rid of all of those systems? Well, I know for me personally, my perspective is while we want to build a new institution, for me, I want to build a new financial institution that people in my community can participate in and can benefit from. But in building a financial institution, it's important to also have um, bridges to, 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 to your partners, to those that, that exist on other parts of the system. Institutions don't exist by, by, by themselves. Then they, they interact with, with other institutions and they become part of the ecosystem. So for me, it's about charting a path where, where we can actually move it and create our space within what exists now. It's not about necessarily ignoring the, the fact that these things exist, but it's actually creating and carving out our, our niche in the, mid, in the midst of the mess, in the midst of people to try to press you, in the midst of people who want to do something differently that will work to, to your harm, to create something that actually benefits you. But you don't have to ignore it because you actually, if you're just ignoring it, you put yourself up for a risk. And, and, and that risk is, in the initial points at least, if, unless you're pseudo, completely anonymous or pseudo-anonymous, such as Satoshi was in the beginning and was able to actually execute your, your idea solely on your own and have that full smart contract ready, if you need those additional resources, you are the point of failure. And if you're that point of failure and you need additional resources to, to do it, you have to protect your, yourself in some way so you can execute on the vision as is. But if you have the capability, well, I totally agree with you. You can actually execute the smart contract uh, uh, pseudonymously and then and run with it. But until that point, you're, 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 the, you're the point of failure. Like I know for my project, I'm the I'm the point of failure. My team is the, the point of failure until the project is actually created and executed. Yeah. Real quick, I'm gonna sit so that the cameras can get in. But the uh, the wealth gap in this country, the mortality rate of ideas that come from underserved communities, particularly the black community, is so much higher. Do you feel that or see in the long term that greater regulation would be a way of being able to shut out the disenfranchised? It is. <laughs> It, it explicitly is. I, <laughs> that, I and, and if so, like, what, what steps are being taken to make sure that we have a vehicle? Because more regulation, higher costs, it means to be able to start a business or to be able to meet those uh, initial prerequisites in our community. I mean, most of the time, we don't qualify for that. That's why there's billions of dollars set aside and earmarked for black communities to start businesses, et cetera. We can't get access to that. And we I, can't get access to that because we don't have the credit rating, we don't have the this, we don't have the that. So where does it stop? I like the gentleman's question in the back, but I was just wondering. Yeah, I, 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 that's one of the things I actually, once we're having a discussion on ICOs, one of the solutions that was, you know, that's currently taking place is private offerings. And in some ways that does protect, you know, the average person who can't afford to lose that kind of money, uh, just ex kind of exclude them from it, but to some extent, 95%, I'll say about 5% of people will probably qualify as a credit investor in the U.S. Um, and I, that's just, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but only because I don't know how many percentage people make $200,000 every year or have net, net worth of $1 million. And then on top of that, for example, I work on a lot of crypto uh, hedge funds that invest exclusively on uh, cryptocurrencies and digital assets. And if they charge, if the investment manager charges a certain uh, performance fee, they have to offer that to a qualified client. That's even a higher threshold where you have to have net worth of at least 2.1 million. Hmm. Uh, so that those are the things that I, I, I think ICOs do offer solution for, you know, another solution was that also showing utility before you actually do it uh, in your ICO. But then again, you also need the money to actually build the system. Chicken egg. Uh, so it's a sort of cash 22. Uh, so I think uh, in a way it is protecting because you know you don't want you know really I think someone last week uh, yesterday mentioned that don't don't invest in any coins. Um, I, I, certainly, I don't subscribe to that notion. But uh, one of his uh, point was that it's not backed by an asset, uh, which is true. Uh, because if you invest in a coin and you have issues, you really have no remedies. Uh, maybe a recession. Uh, I mean, a recession. But that's not uh, so. That that is the danger there. But so the the trick is trying to protect that issue while not excluding once in a lifetime generation building type of wealth that could come from this. Uh, I think Warren Buffett mentioned before how he got rich and he said, I was at the right place at the right time and I was interested in the right things. And right now you could be at the right place, right time, interested in the right things, could still be excluded because you don't have the funding. 
Uh, so I think that's something, uh, that's a good point. We, we got the wrap up signal uh, for the powers that be, so give our panel a round of applause. <laughs> This was a very high IQ crypto conversation right here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>